Okay, so you did this pretty well. Um, obviously, you're going to use Gibbs free energy to do this. If you, first of all, you need to work out delta S for the reaction. Delta S for the reaction um, is going to be the uh, products minus the reactants. So it's 70 minus 48. So if I do that, delta S is going to equal 70 minus 48, which gives you 22. Remember that's in joules per mole per Kelvin. So I must always convert that into kilojoules per mole per Kelvin for when I go on for Gibbs free energy. Um, therefore, you know delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. If it's just occurring, delta G is zero. So delta H equals T delta S, or T equals delta H. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, no respect. <laughs> Um, delta H, what was delta H? Delta H was 6.01. Delta S, we worked out 0.22, and that gives me 298 Kelvin, which is zero to, uh, 25. Oh no, two, no, it's not, it's 273. 273 Kelvin, zero degrees. Six. Okay, so I don't like this question, um, but. Yeah, I know, many of you didn't. <coughs> okay, so how do you do this? They want you to use initial rates. So if you start talking about measuring half-lives and all that malarkey, it ain't going to happen. They want you to talk about initial rates. So how would you do that? Well, the key thing, if you think about those tables that they give you, you would, first of all, um, do an experiment where you vary the concentration of... Um, S2, O8, 2 minus, and keep the concentration of oh, I okay. minus so constant. No, I don't know. You would then do an experiment where you vary I minus, but keep that constant. Remember how those tables work? One stays the same, you vary the other one. Um, then you, you know the rate is equal to the concentration change over time. So you have to tell them how you would then measure the rate. And you then do you would do a rate concentration graph. Which if it's first order would be would be a straight line. So then you would do a rate concentration graph, um, which gives a straight line through the origin. Couldn't you just do it by the very values in the table that we don't have before? Yeah, because yeah, I did. Yeah. We keep this constant down this from the Well, actually, no, you can't just work out the rate from a problem. <coughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Oh, uh, right, so carrying on. Um, in one of the experiments, the, those two react together. The rate is it. They told you it's first order. So you know... Rate is equal to the rate constant times concentration of iodide and S2O8 to minus both first order. You substitute these in, divided by 8.0 times 6 to the minus 2 and 4.0 times 10 to the minus 3. Um, I really would practice doing these type of things in your calculator. Loads of people stuff up when they put it in their calculator. That equals K. You know, to work this one out if you're not happy with how to do it in your calculator. Um, that should give you K as being equal to... Um, K equals 3.75. And your units, decimeters, moles to the minus one, seconds to the minus one. Because that's in moles per decimeter cubed per second, and then you've got two moles per decimeter cubed, whoops, squared, like that. So um, that's going to cancel, isn't it? That's going to go. So that goes up, that goes up, and that stays the yeah. same. Okay, so this wasn't too bad, actually. Um, you've just got to do the two equations. 
most of you will write for this one. So, it tells me S2O82 minus can be catalyzed with F2 plus. If you look at your electro potentials, that one is the most positive, so that's got to go that way, um, which means um, the other one has got to be reversed to that one. So equation one, and notice this one therefore has to be times by two. So it's S2O82 minus plus 2Fe2 plus goes to 2SO42 minus plus 2Fe3 plus. Once you've got your Fe3 plus, that can then react. That can go that way and that goes that way. So you always have to make one product and then carry something. So that's where you get yeah. along different lines. Yeah, you, 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 you mix the lines up, didn't yeah. you? Uh, plus 2i minus goes to i2, all plus 2fe2 plus. You've regenerated your fe2 plus, and that's why it's. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we do. Um, Suggest so why this reaction is also catalyzed by fe3 plus. Well, if you have a look at your um, electro potentials, Fe3 plus would go that way and it would react with iodide ions that way. You've just done the equation. So you just say it can go right? Oh uh, yeah, so um, it's, it's quite feasible for Fe3 plus to react with iodide ions based on the electro potentials. So it's based on the electro potentials? Oh uh, right, so this one, mm, relatively straightforward probably, um, as far as the equilibrium goes. Um, I mix this and this together, <coughs> seal it, total volumes is okay, analyse it, um, what am I left with at the end? I'm left with 0.052 moles of that. So that has gone up by 0.052 moles. So that, because it's one to one, must have gone down. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> so that means that's 0.062. Now, key thing. For every one of those, you need two of those. So if that's gone down by 0 0.0, times, by two. times by two, yeah. real. So that must have gone down by 0 0.104. Um, so 0 0.152 minus 0 0.104. That should give me 0 0.048. Right, you then need, the, they've given you the volume in centimetres cubed. You need to time convert that into moles per decimeter cubed. So your concentrations are 0.062. Well, basically, rather than me doing that, can you just see I had to times everything? Oh no, I can't do it. Okay, divided by 200 times by a thousand. <coughs> divided by 200 times by a thousand, and then this one. But you don't have to. Well, you could just times it by five. You could just times it by five. Yeah. Um, right, so uh, to convert the mole, equilibrium moles into concentrations, divide by 200 times by 1,000 to convert it into moles per decimeter cube. Then you need to put it into Kc. Kc is going to equal the concentration of methanol over the concentration of carbon monoxide and the concentration of H2 squared. So if you do that, 0 0.26 divided by 0 0.31 times 0 0.2 <coughs> squared, you should end up with the answer being 14.6, and the units are decimeters to the six, moles to the minus two. How did I get that? Well, that's in moles per decimeter cube, so that cancels with that, so those units, so it ends up being one over moles per decimeter cubed squared. Okay, so B, the chemist repeats the experiment, um, but the mixture is heated to a higher temperature. Um, here's the same amount. The procedure is used. The mixture is heated in a silk container to a higher temperature. The gas volume is kept the same, and therefore we are also increasing the pressure. So, if we have a look at the reaction at the top, is an exothermic reaction, so which way will the equilibrium shift? So yeah, so we can say it's an exothermic reaction, the equilibrium will shift to the left hand side and Kc will decrease. decrease. Brilliant.
Um, in terms of pressure, if I increase the pressure, the equilibrium will shift to the right hand side because there were fewer moles of gas on the right hand side. Will that affect Casey at all? No, no that won't affect Casey. So Casey will decrease because of temperature. Why therefore is it difficult to predict? Well, it's difficult to because temperature is pushing it that way, but pressure is pushing it that way, and I don't know what the the main um, well who's going to win basically. How do you put that into words? Um, I refer to the Marsky. Um, higher pressure shifts to the right. <coughs> Temp higher temperature shifts the position of equilibrium to the left because the forward reaction is exothermic. Therefore, Kc decreases, um, and therefore the relative effect of pressure and temperature is not known. Okay, so this one, hopefully, um, you kind of nailed these diagrams. Um, I've, I've got to do, um, I've got to measure redox one, um, and therefore, and it's with a, a, a hydrogen electrode. So, my electrode is going to be iron, my solution is going to be one mole per decimeter cube Fe2 plus aqueous. That's going to be connected to a voltmeter, which will be connected to a platinum electrode. The hydrogen gas goes in there at one atmosphere. That goes into my beaker, like so, and in my beaker is H plus aqueous, one mole per decimeter cube and then you link them all together with a salt bridge, like so. A bit of a dodgy diagram, but I think it gets to the point across. Okay, um, the next question, you've got to be careful. It asks for the alkaline hydrogen oxygen fuel cells. Because it's under alkaline conditions, you can't use that one, because that's in acid conditions. So you've got to use that one. So that's the reaction that's happening at the oxygen. So this is an easy peasy mark, isn't it? You've just got to copy out uh, 4 OH minus. What's the reaction happening at the hydrogen? You've got to re re reverse this one, haven't you? Because it's actually hydrogen that reacts to give you 2 H2O. Oh, okay. Plus 2 electrons. Okay, you've then got to times this one. When you combine them together for the next part, you've got to times this one by two, haven't you? So would you use, you're using four and five, you? I'm using four and I'm using two. Because five involves oxygen under acidic conditions. And you should end up with it being H2 plus a half O2 goes to H2O as your overall equation. Um, the electrode, well the potential that you'll get is a difference between that one and that one. So it's 0 0.4 minus minus 0 0.83, which gives you it as being uh, one point, is it two, three volts. I'm still not quite sure what you've done with A, like how did you put them together? Oh, well these two. No, like, yeah, from the redox. Um, okay, so that's got two electrons on. Yeah. So I've got to times that by two. And this is, that's number four and that's number two. That one there is number four. Okay. That one there is number two that I've yeah. reversed. I add them together. Can you see now? And they're the two half equations. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah, yeah, and then I just add them together. Okay, if that's yeah. what they mean. Yeah. You have to, like, balance the electrons. Yeah. A conventional storage cell, um, you, you have the reactants in and it uses them up. For a fuel cell, you have a constant supply of hydrogen and oxygen gas going in and therefore constant supply of energy. People often assume they're carbon neutral. Why is that not the case? Well, probably we've had to get the hydrogen from somewhere. So, and we probably used, maybe we could have burnt fossil fuels to produce the hydrogen. That's why I put it across 